All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be talking with Hong Kong movie legend, Bay Logan. Lots of gems, lots of clones of Bruce Lee, and lots of, you want to fight my Sifu, you're going to have to fight me first. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Hey, Bay, how you doing? I'm fantastic. Couldn't be happy being here in Astoria, Queens. Yes. Which is like where Spider-Man came from, which is how I grew up reading comic books and thinking about Spider-Man in Queens. Now I'm here. That's right. And with a real life superhero, the Kung Fu genius. (laughs) And I can't believe I'm like sitting in the chair recently vacated by the great Richard Norton. Yeah, him on. <laughs> That's right. right. Well, he wasn't actually in that chair. No. He was he he was in a laptop metaphorically. sitting in yeah, metaphorically, metaphorically in that chair. Yes, and I yeah. the whole thing in Rich's accent, just so you you know about my dad. He was a bit of karate master. Wait, I can't tell the difference between that accent exactly. and your accent. Sorry. No. It's the same as Mikey's, right? Yeah. You are a son of a bitch. <laughs> Richard is Richard is wasn't is one of the greatest guys in the business. He is, yeah. And the real deal in martial arts and in movies. And it was an interesting story because I mean unbeknownst to him he kind of grew up he was uh, training under my stepfather tino severano and he was training around my mom who was also a highly great sheree who was a highly graded black belt without any concept that years later he would meet me who was the son of uh sheree severano tino's uh wife and i'd grown up in england i've been adopted i've been adopted and grew up in england i didn't meet until i think he was doing city hunter wow. with jackie chan Sing Lipian, and then we finally met and it was kind of odd because he knew of me from the martial arts magazines and the martial yeah. art world. And of course, he'd grown up with the Australian family. And again, it's like somebody says, uh, somebody wrote, um, truth is stranger than fiction because fiction has to make sense. <laughs> and I think if you put that in a, in a novel or a screenplay, everybody would say, you get the, the coverage back from the studio, does not make sense. Right. But it happened. Wow. So we have to live with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for that introduction. That, that interview is absolutely forgotten. wonderful. I introduced yeah. you to Richard. Yeah. That's one t- one great, and it was such a great uh, podcast. So yeah. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we had a chance to talk when I was in Hong Kong. Yeah. And that episode, by the way, did very well. Apparently Thank you. People everybody, like, th- everybody listened. Yeah. People like to watched. listen to us uh, talk uh, uh, mm. to each other. And, uh, so I wanted to continue and talk, Please. continue on uh, the perennial well yes. of Bruce Lee and, and yeah. Hong Kong uh, films and, yeah. and your career in that. So I guess to get started, you've had uh, the awesome opportunity while living in Hong Kong to yeah. meet a lot of people who work with Bruce Lee. Right. And you even introduced us to the great and mighty Mars yes. when we were well, there thanks. last yeah. year when we did the the Hong Kong tour. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you just what are some of your best stories and recollections from people that uh, you have met that mm. worked with Bruce Lee? And maybe some some things that uh, even even a big fan may may not know right. or may not have heard. Yeah. Um, if you have anything, whether it was with B. Chan or Lam Ching Ying yeah. or Mars or any of these guys. Well, what's been fascinating to me is the perspective of somebody who day by day goes to work with somebody like Bruce Lee. Because it's interesting now with the kind of the distance of time that we have, we look, oh, this legend, oh my God, you were there working with a legend. And I work with a number of people I consider to be legends like Jackie Chan or Donnie Yen or Sam Hung. But I can tell you that the day-by-day mechanisms of making a movie as such, that you don't really feel that way. Maybe you have an initial moment of, holy, oh, you know, holy, you know, good God, I'm working with Jackie Chan. But then once you get into the day-by-day problem solving. So I was fascinated by the common ground of these guys going to work with Bruce Lee, but how much of it was like, we actually have a film to make and how we're going to deal with that. So there's the, the, the actual, there were two kinds of stories. There's the actual stories about the making of films, and then there were the activities and things that happened off camera. But I remember when I first moved to Hong Kong, hanging out with Ban Ma Jai, Zebra Pan, who um, was one of the core stunt group who worked with Bruce Lee in the films that he made when he came back to Hong Kong. And uh, he told me, we were talking about uh, on the first two films, The Big Boss and Fist of Fury, the uh, action director of credit is uh, Han Yin Jie. But obviously, the f- action in the movies is is almost entirely, particularly on Fist of Fury, that of Bruce Lee. And um, Zebra told me when they first did the big dojo fight in uh, in Fist of Fury, this was the first time. And uh, and I said, so how was it? Did Bruce Lee kind of banish, uh, you know, Han Yin Jie and Low away from the set and just take over because he was now this big star after mm-hmm. the big boss. And he says, no, actually, he's hung back. And Hang Ning Jie set up what was more like a Jimmy Wong Yu fight, you know, when Wong Yu would fight left to right, fight you, fight you, fight you, fight you, and then back again. 
knocking them all down, then knocking them back up again. Um, and uh, Bruce watched this, and he comes in, and he had this gesture. You can see him in photographs doing it when he puts his hands together in a very kind of respectful kind of way. And he says to, you know, Honey and Joe, dress him as uncle. And he says, this is, how could you deal with this? How could we deal with that? And contrary to the way I think Bruce is like portrayed in, you know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and contrary maybe to the image of him as this quite harsh person, what I admire about Bruce, and I've tried to um, absorb into my own filmmaking efforts, is he would be, he, he would be sharp and angry upwards to the bosses, to the investors, to other stars. And he would be gentle going down. But a lot of these guys you see today is the wrong direction. They're kind of like chat high. They're kind of like, you know, kind of like toadying to the high rollers. And they're mm -hmm. giving a hard time to the crew, giving a hard time to the extras. And Bruce was the opposite. So he, he was uh, respectful uh, to everybody. But he also had a good way of dealing with the, the high, somebody of the tradition. And of course, his father... Uh, Lei Hoichun had known uh, uh, Han Yin Jie very well in the opera days. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so there was a very tight circle. Okay. I mean, you had like uh, Yu Jim Yun, who was uh, Jackie Chan's teacher. You had like Lei Hoichun. You had people like Han Yin Jie. Everybody was in the opera world and knew each other very well. Yun Siu Tin, yes. the father of uh, Yin Wu Peng. Right. Um, and so it was very interesting to hear the story of, of Bruce kind of gently pushing, um, you know, Uncle. Han Han to the side. And then, in the words of Zebra Pan, he started to do Bruce Lee, uh -huh. which I'm thinking, oh, and he said it was like really in Chinese, that Hoi Nan guy. Everybody was, oh my God. Because then he came out and I'm going to kick this guy, I'm going to kick this guy in the top shot of everybody doing their thing. And then, you know, the camera on a dolly and boom, all the stuff he does in that scene. And then he pulls out the nunchucks and bam, 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 bam. And, but he led into it by slowly saying, maybe we could try this, maybe we could try that. And then that was the first scene that he said that you really started to see him doing Bruce Lee. Wow, that's was... interesting because we often hear the stories about Bruce Lee being somewhat cocky. Right. And what I like is that you gave it a little bit of context. It was about who he was being. Correct. Cocky too, I suppose, because we also hear all the stories about him fighting for the stuntman to get yeah. better meals on Enter the Dragon. And when I would hear, it was always kind of perceived that you had um, um, Hon Yin Git, Han Yin Che, um, was the choreographer for Big Boss, yeah. and, and he also is the Big Boss. Yeah. And then in the second movie, he gets kind of pushed aside, and it makes it, the, the feeling is that that was always somewhat acrimonious, but you see photos of Bruce Lee cutting uh, Hon Yin Git's no, hair, and, like, and it always seemed like, actually, they always seemed kind no. of close to each other. He right? knew how to do it, and um, the way it was divided on the film is if you look at the, film, the fights in the film that don't include Bruce, they're very much old school. And yes. so like uh, Han Sifu had complete control over that. The, the fight when the Japanese come to yeah. Jingwu where All Bruce of that is, is like yet. old school stuff. Yes. And then you look at uh, Bruce's kind of, Bruce's stuff is very Bruce Lee, yeah. as, a, as Van Majai was saying. So I don't think that, I think that's a misapprehension, the idea of Bruce being this very harsh. And I mean, I, I also, I think, and you know, I would say this is something that's true of you and a, a lot of the people I know is like, to me, martial arts is limiting if you only use it in the Mogun or the dojo. Martial art, martial strategy should be, you know, uh, the bing, you know, the bing fa really? should be used in daily life. And I often look at somebody who's making their life work and not saying that we don't all make mistakes, not saying that we don't have catastrophes, but then in some ways you define somebody much like you can learn a lot when somebody comes back from a loss in sure. a fight, what do they learn? Uh, and also you learn a lot from somebody coming back from a difficult situation. What do they learn? How do they survive and grow? But martial arts are useful for that. And people ask me, you know, it's like, well, what's the use of Kung Fu if you're not doing MMA, if you're not fighting off people in the street? And I go, no, but it's because you're living it every day. Yeah. You know, and I think Bruce, um, there's been, to my <laughs> mind, a little bit too much. That's the, the lovely daughters of, uh, of Alex <laughs> I did forget to in the background. <laughs> no, I, I love the fact that they're singing in the background. I'd rather push people listen to them than me. <laughs> but, you know, that this, um, that, uh, there's been a little bit, for my taste, this desire to reposition Bruce Lee as kind of a new age hippie guru, like a Kung Fu Deepak yes. Chopra. Right. I think that's going a bit far. Absolutely. But within the context of what he was doing, he knew how to play and how to kind of use uh, what particular manifestation of himself, you know, wrathful or playful, 
to get what he needed. And he was confrontational and he could be very confrontational with the bosses. Um, and, you know, Ray, there's stories about Raymond Chow and then later he confronted Lawway. Um, but in those cases, I think it was less he lost control as much as he needed. He felt that in the time disrespected or cheated. And so he wanted to assert himself in that way. But um, and it's interesting when you talk about people always talk about Bruce Lee as a real fighter in the context of the late 60s and early 70s. What was a real fighter? We didn't have MMA cage matches. You had undocumented street fights in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Right. To me, if you look at the stuntmen at that time, many of them were like part-time gangsters, full-time stuntmen or full-time stuntmen, part-time gangsters or whatever. There, there was this kind of intersection between the martial arts world, the movie world, um, and, and, and the gang world that was Hong Kong cinema of the 60s and 70s and up into the 80s and the 90s. It was a longer conversation, I think, about the involvement of triads or gangs in sure. the entertainment industry. But at that time, that definitely, the guys who were around Bruce had real world, real fight experience in a way that, with the exception maybe of Mike Stone, uh, none of the American top champions did. I don't know about Louis Delgado, but Mike Stone definitely was a Hawaiian brawler. Yeah. You know, he'd come from the mean streets. But, you know, people, bless him, you know, he's a lovely man, but people like Chuck Norris, they didn't have that kind of, and it, Chuck would admit it, that kind of hands-on brawl, you know, live and let die sure. street situations. He hadn't had that. Right. So for people to be judging Bruce Lee as a real fighter, I look at the stuntman. If he had showed up as like a paper tiger, and, you know, because him coming back, the last time anybody had seen him, in, in Hong Kong, he was like a child actor. Yes. So it was like Macaulay Culkin coming back and right. doing Rambo. Right. And then he showed up and it was like, got James Tien pushed to the side on Big Boss, goes to Thailand and all the stuntmen, both I think the Hong Kong stuntmen and to some degree the Thai stuntmen, but who's this guy I think he is? Yeah. And he had to prove himself. And uh, I heard a story from uh, Abi, uh, Chan Wing Ai, who was one of the other key members of the, he plays one of Bruce's cousins in, in Big Boss. And he was, uh, Another member of the key stunt team. He told me a and story. And he's also brother of Billy the late great the, the uh, late Peter Chan. Chan Long. Chan Long. Yeah, 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 Peter yeah. Chan. Who I think he has the, he's the first guy that Bruce Lee kicks in Big Boss. So he's <laughs> going out history with that. He's another lovely guy. Uh, so, so sad loss. Yeah. But Abi uh, told me about how um, there was this perennial these stories in the media about so and so had challenged Bruce Lee. So and so, and the famous one was a uh, Lao Dai Chun had challenged Bruce Lee to a match. And uh, Abi told me that the, he. Bruce and the stunt team were in uh, some restaurant, some dim sum restaurant. Uh, and then uh, he told me it was on a Sunday, I, uh, but I don't know why that stuck in my mind. And famously, Bruce, because he was so famous at that time, would sit facing away from the crowded room. Yeah. And then the stunt team would be around him and they're all eating and whatever. And Lao Dai Chun was in the same restaurant, which if you know Hong Kong, it's such a small place. It's entirely possible. Absolutely. I mean, you go into the whole, you know, kind of conspiracy thing. He must have, the triads were following him. No, right. he just happened to be there. I run into people in Hong Kong more often than I run into people here yeah. in New York that I know. And it's a strange all the time. It's way. crazy. Yeah. So um, from what Abi said, that uh, the, the most ferocious of the stuntmen, and Samo said the same, was Lam Qingying, who had it's played hard to believe. Mr. Vampire. No, right. I mean... Just, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but there was a famous story when they were filming in Korea, which used to happen a lot. And of course, Sammo Hong's first wife is uh, Korean. Right. Um, and that he, they, were, they were in a bar there, and it was him and Lam Ching Ying doing a movie in Korea. And Sammo went to the restroom, and there were some GIs, American GIs, who were stationed in, uh, in, in Seoul, were there. And he came back and found that somehow Lam Ching Ying had in, instigated a brawl with these guys. Wow. And you just look at him and you think, no, it's just the quiet ones you got to watch, Alex. Sure, sure. <laughs> and apparently they were sitting there and then, um, you know, somebody said, hey, I hope you know, I love that. Love, love, love. They're sitting there, right? Love, love, who's been openly challenging Bruce in the papers. And then everybody was like looking to Bruce for a signal. And uh, it was a bit like, have you ever seen that uh, Yorkshireman? Uh, no. the, 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 the sketch from uh, Monty Python when it says, you wouldn't believe in our day, we went to sleep <laughs> half an hour before we went to sleep. We woke up, our dad would slash us with an inch of our lives and we had a gravel. You were lucky. 
And at the end, <laughs> that everybody, each of the Yorkshiremen tries to outdo how awful things were in the in the bad old days. Got you know, it. you know, we slept in a gravel pit. Pit, you were lucky. <laughs> and at the end of it, um, uh, John Cleese, there's a beat, and then John Cleese goes, right. And then he's, he goes into his, which is the long thing. And it was a bit like that with, La, with Lam Ching. Everybody was saying, oh, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. And then Lam Ching goes, right. <laughs> Pulls up his sleeve, goes over there, stands over uh, Lao Dai Chun, looks him in the eye and says, if you want to fight my Sifu, you have to go through me first. Right. Let's do it. And Lao Dai Chun basically looked down in his rice bowl and <laughs> didn't want any of it. And you, you look at uh, those people maybe... Some of the people may not know Lam Ching Ying is he played Mr. Vampire in Gong Si Sen San. He was and one Le of the... Leung Yi Tai in Prodigal Son. What yeah. a great performance. Yeah. You know, the great, his, his great best, performance. Yeah, yeah. But he was a very, very uh, eclectic actor. He had wonderful range. I mean, you see him, he plays the police captain in City on... No, uh, Pr School on Fire, the Ringo mm -hmm. Lam movie. Mm -hmm. And then he Painted was... faces. He was yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, no, wonderful actor. And he, yeah. pa again, passed away way too soon. But he was in the Bruce movies, and then he was in all the Sam Hung films. But this wiry, he's got the Mac Sifu yeah. wiry figure. But he went over there and confronted him, and then after um, Lao Dai Chun wouldn't rise to the occasion, I think he slapped the table and came back and sat down next to Bruce, and Bruce was like, you know, like, my guys. But the fact that there was this loyalty, this, um, you know, kind of, like, unthinking devotion, you know from this that Bruce was, firstly... You know, he really could fight. And he also said, Yihei. he would know how to take care of his guys. Right. Um, and I know I've been around other martial art movie actors, stars, where I think, and it's probably been proven, the day he stopped paying these guys, they're gone. His garban, his Entourage, team. Yeah. You stop paying them, they're gone. In Bruce's case, if he had lived longer, if he'd had some kind of fall from grace and been broke, they would have all have paid for him and for his life. And I think the most telling, one of the telling things is the way all of those guys are like the security at his funeral. Yes. You know, so. Um, yeah. yeah, Chan Long brought Brandon and Shannon out of the car into yeah. the funeral. They were yeah. just there. For, for me, this perennial question of was Bruce Lee a real fighter in the context of that era? You don't need to talk to any of the American point champions don't need to talk to any of the other guys who were doing, you know, Korea, principally Korean martial arts. It's interesting. Korean martial arts in America had a massive influence compared to Japanese ones. Yes. And Korean martial art had a massive influence in the early development of Hong Kong action cinema in the 70s when it moved away from, you know, Dolgim as a sword and, you know, blade and sword to a Kun Gurk, fist and foot. Everybody was learning not Kung Fu. They were all learning Hapkido. So uh, the Korean martial arts had a massive influence. But at the same time, I don't look at those masters. There are some who could see what Bruce Lee was or what he was capable of, like Jun Ri and people. But then now and later, people have interviewed and damned him with faint praise and said he wasn't like, he, had, he didn't compete. Yeah, competing in those days was yeah, you score tag, a score point. Yeah, it's a touch football. <laughs> and you know what the funny thing about it is, uh, with his speed, yeah. if you said, okay, we'll play tag, I think he would have won at that. Absolutely. But why would he want to? Yeah. He was doing what we now know of as MMA. Yeah. But that wasn't available to him as a competitive platform, a competitive arena at that time. But I think the stuntmen and their opinions, which I've had the blessing, we had Mars, as you say, for Singh there the other day, they're to a man. And Samo, who was the top dog at Golden Harvest when Bruce came back from, uh, from America, you know, to a man, they all say he was the real deal. Right. Hey everyone, just want to let you know Wing Chun Illustrated is now offering a paperback edition through Amazon reaching a larger global market. And no, they're not ditching the glossy magazine edition through MagCloud. You can now simply choose the version of this magazine you prefer and the one with the cheapest shipping wherever you live. Order your copy of Wing Chun Illustrated today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping for Prime members. Go and check that out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, transition continue on the Bruce Lee topic, but perhaps in a slightly different way. So I famously, at least for <laughs> listeners to my podcast, hate Bruce exploitation films. Right. And I think that's because when I started watching Bruce Lee films, um, as a young child, I quickly realized, oh, there's not that many of them. No. And I would go to the video store and there would be these other videos yeah. that would have like some guy who looked like Bruce Lee, but even 
to my eight year old eye, I'm like, yeah, but that's not actually Bruce Lee, but he looks like him. And the name of the film is kind of like one of these Bruce Lee movies. Yeah. So even without watching them, uh, I kind of uh, grew a very strong distaste for them just because I just felt they, they just looked fraudulent. And I'm like, even as an eight year old, I know that's not Bruce Lee. Stop trying to fool me. So I never really gave them the time of day. The first and only, uh, uh, well, I did finally see Bruce Lee, the, the man, the myth. Yes, or I was going to mention whatever. that. Yeah. I, I did see that, but my father, my father was, my father's great. When I was, it was a kid, he always supported my martial arts habit. He would go to Germany and he would like find some Bruce Lee stuff in German and he would just buy it from me and bring it back. Sweet. And the first video cassette he brought me was like, it, it, the, the German title was like, the Todeskala schlägt zu, which is like the death claw comes back or something like that. And it was this guy, Bruce L.E., in the game of death tracksuit fighting these two black dudes. And I looked at that and I'm like, and I didn't want to say, because I love my dad, I didn't want to say anything. Hey, dad, this is not really Bruce Lee. But because it said Bruce Lee with two E's on the German cover. And so I watched it. And I, I just remember... Uh, being happy that my dad got this for me, but being angry that some putz is trying to sell himself as Bruce Lee, uh. not knowing any of that. So I think because as a n eight and nine and 10 year old, I had that strong distaste and never gave those films a time of day. People constantly tell me that they're somehow great or that I should watch this one or that one. I did watch Bruce Lee, the man, the myth like a year or so ago. Yeah. They say that's the gold standard. I wasn't particularly blown away because of the creative licenses they took with Bruce Lee's story. Yeah. So as a Hong Kong film expert, <laughs> as someone who's seen these things, can you explain to me the phenomenon? Can you tell yeah. me if I'm wrong? Can you explain to me <laughs> why I should watch these movies? What, so what is the deal? Well, by the way, I love the fact that your father bought that stuff for you. I should have mentioned that my late father, Morris, my, my adoptive father, bought my first VHS copy of Enter the Dragon from a store in Peterborough, England, for a Christmas present. And wow. as he was leaving, turned back and said, it is the uncensored version. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him. But no, there was a, 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 there was a comedian, an American comedian, who said, if there's any justice in the world, Elvis would be alive and all the impersonators would be dead. Yes. <laughs> so I guess in your case, you could apply that to Bruce. <laughs> I have mixed feelings about it. I, I On one level, I, under, I mean, I do like, I have enjoyed and do watch on occasion the Bruce exploitation films. I don't like them as much as my friend Michael Worth, right. but I still like them. Right. And I remember thinking of it as being like fantasy baseball. Like, what if Bruce had fought Bolo? What if Bruce had used kung fu weapons? What if Bruce had actually shown kung fu in his movies? Because as I point out in my book, Bruce Lee and I, all the movies of Bruce Lee are defined as kung fu movies, but they have hardly any what we would classify as Kung Fu right. in it is like right. cinematic kickboxing or weapons moves adapted from other cultures. But in terms of Kung Fu, he didn't live to make his Kung Fu movie. Sure. So then in a way, the better made of the uh, Bruce Plotation films fulfill that fantasy of what if, what if Bruce Lee had lived, okay. how would that have been? My um, beef with them is, uh, not so much that they don't have the verisimilitude, even something, a superior one, like you mentioned, Bruce Lee, the man and the legend, that not that they play fast and loose, because my God, from what I can see, all of the other things, the Bruce Lee television series that came out of uh, China that Shannon put her name on, the uh, Spirit of the Dragon, which she chastised, um, Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, which I adore, all of them did the same. Right. Um, but it, what's interesting is, I think, you know, if you're a fan of Elvis and you watch that amazing Elvis film, from what I hear, they say, well, you know what? You know, he didn't do this. He didn't. Oh, okay. But you're telling a story. It's sure. like almost like uh, the medieval idea of a palimpsest that you take the basic underlying outline and you embellish it. And to some degree, and this is really kind of giving a kind of a highfalutin explanation of, of the exploitation films, the Bruce exploitation films, they're like a palimpsest of Bruce Lee. You've got the outline of Bruce Lee beneath and then drawn on top is all this stuff. With some of them, why, given the, 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 the filmmaking capacity of Hong Kong at that time, why some of them were quite so bad? Bruce Le is the guy with the great physique, good martial arts skills. We're talking with the one E. Why, yes, why he is so awful of an actor, why he is allowed to be so terrible of an actor, uh -huh. film by film, is extraordinary, that nobody pulled him up and said, dude, you know, if, 
at least if you're going to play, even though this is an exploitation film, even though you're here because you look like Bruce Lee, you still have to act. Right. But no one seemed to have that thought in their mind. They were just basically, yeah, good enough, put him out there. And that, the, the, the sloppiness of it kind of bothers me more than, more than anything else. But I do find them really entertaining. And I, um, one of the movies that I adored and watched again and again was Clones of Bruce Lee. Okay. With my late friend John Ben as this mad professor who indeed clones Bruce Lee. And he clones with like a, what seems to be a karaoke machine and uh, a hairdryer and, uh, and dry ice. And then he clones one Bruce Lee after the other. And it would be great. I think that should be rescored to, you know, in, the, in Fantasia, when in Sorcerer's Apprentice, da, 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 when he goes out of control and, yes. you know, the, the broomsticks start multiplying. That's the scene they should have had with all the Bruce Lees together. But I, I just thought it was just, and Dragon Lee, mm -hmm. who's actually this a Korean kind actor, of right? a Korean yeah. Russian dude. His real name is like Vladimir Valivostok or something. And <laughs> he's like, uh, he's, he's like the James Brown of, uh, of, he's got this kind of like you know, hardest, his face is one of the hardest working faces in show business. His face has, his whole body is incredibly muscular, right. but his face has muscles that no other human does. <laughs> I mean, if you watch, there's a scene in uh, Clones of Bruce Lee when the nurse is walking with him in the garden and it's kind of like that nanny 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 music playing and you're, you're seeing him through the outer focus flowers. So it's what amounts for a romantic scene uh, in this film. We're doing this after Valentine's Day. So let's talk about the romance of Dragon Lee and the nurse. And, so, and then she turns to him and she says, Oh, Dragon, I don't know. I don't think I trust the doctor. And then the camera pushes this to Dragon Lee and it's like just, bits are moving like you know a little muscle here and one here and one here and it's extraordinary it's like you know muscles the human face has never before expressed <laughs> are all there and uh, you watch all the dragon lee movies there's a moment when his face just does all these things and again it really needs to be re-sound re effect with like <sighs> popping noises and whatever i mean you'd save so much money if you'd like a, a, a werewolf film with him the first part of the transformation free you just have him respond to a line of dialogue and do all this, all that stuff. So these things, to me, in my twisted state of mind, I just I love them. Uh -huh. And I remember, you know, my partner Elizabeth and I, I made her watch Clones of Bruce Lee, and we just found it, you know, hugely enjoyable. So I think there's, on one level, you look at them and go, "What if Bruce Lee had lived? This is kind of scene that might have happened." Secondarily, you have the the kind of a schlock factor that these are entertainingly cheesy. But I made the mistake. I was, um, you know, if I can drop a name from a great height, you know, doom. I was in Cannes Film Festival with Quentin Tarantino, and he was describing for me, shot by shot, the film that was going to be Kill Bill, because the company I was working with at the time was involved with Kill Bill. And uh, I made the mistake of talking about, you know, films are so bad, they're good. And he's, no, they're not bad, they're they're, 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 they're good. You know, if you, if you know what you're looking at and for, these are not bad movies. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then he, I'm like, an example. And he actually, um, I think this is probably, you know, you exhibit A uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, but he much somewhat disparages the real Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. But he likes those movies with the impersonators. And he can quote you chapter and verse on Fist of Fury 2 with Ho Jung Do, uh, Bruce Lai, mm -hmm. L.I., mm -hmm. and Law Lee, who was the star of Five Fingers of Death, sure. Teen Ha Dai Kyun, um, King Boxer, yes. which was the first, Bruce, first kung fu movie to break, right. before the Bruce Lee's broke it in, yeah. in, in Hollywood. the villain from 36 Chambers. Right. So, yeah. And um, so he does chapter and verse about how prior to the final duel, there's a discussion about calligraphy between Bruce Lai, L.I., and Law Lee. And he loves... Fist of Fury 2 more than he loves Fist of Fury, you know. But I'll tell you a sweet story about that. So I had that, um, my, my, my dinner with, it was more my beer with Quentin, and we sat until about, geez, I don't know, four in the morning, very early, because we were just talking about scenes from, 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 I was one of the few people who could probably recognize every scene he was homaging for the planned um, a Kill Bill, which was not yet made. Mm -hmm. and also talk about the other films and what, what, what was this guy like. And, you know, we, it's a back and forward and we're very happy. I was there with an, a British actor, a former friend of mine, Gary Daniels. Uh -huh. And so I'm glad I had a witness because and we took a picture. So we actually, it really did happen. But Gary was there for the whole thing. So he knew that this conversation did happen. But then the next morning I was out on the Quasette, which is the big beachside 
you know, road in Cannes where mm. you see everybody walking and talking and taking photos, doing interviews, doing the Cannes Film Festival every year. And to my amazement, out of the mist, Lawleet manifest himself. And I was just so amazed. And I went up to him and I said, oh, I think, oh, you know, so good to see you here. And he vaguely remembers me from Hong Kong. And I'm explaining in Cantonese that this director last night said that he thought you were one of the greatest actors of Hong Kong cinema. Uh -huh. And I didn't say on the basis of Fist of Fury 2, but I said he thought you were the best, the greatest. And then I was trying to explain to the Lord who Quentin Tarantino was, you know, like, chop the ear off, you know, like dancing, uh, stuck in the middle with you. And, you know, it's just, oh, Talentin Talantino, whatever Quentin's Chinese name is, uh -huh. which I forget. And I said, that, that's the guy, that's the guy. He said you were the best. Hwale hai joy sai le go ying yu I heard Hong Kong. And then he was like, I'm a, oh, so I said, thank him for me, right? Uh -huh. And then we chatted for a bit more. He was there promoting some dramatic film he'd made in Taiwan. And then I just said, last thing I said, remember, you're the greatest. And then he turned and walked away. And I remember watching him go down the croisette and the people crossing in front. And it was such a random moment. It was mm -hmm. like the guy from King Boxer here in Cannes under the blue skies. Right. And then a month later, he passed away. So it was one of those few moments in life that you met somebody who you had huge regard for and you had the opportunity to say exactly the right thing. So I thanked Quentin. I, I told Quentin about that. He started crying the big sock. But no, because he was really happy that because of our, our again, random conversation the yes. night before, again, as I said at the top of this, a lot of things in life, were they depicted in fiction, would be dismissed as unrealistic. Right. But we talked about Lolly the night before and I met him the next day. Wow. So that was the story. Wow. Uh, one, one last thing on this uh, Bruce Bluetation yes. topic. Uh, so from the Hong Kong filmmakers' perspective, yes. where are they making these films primarily pool a foreign audience that may not know the difference between Bruce Lee and oh, yeah. any of these other guys? Or was there any aspect of it that this was also for the local audience? Uh, by my perception, I mean, I was a consumer at this time. Mm -hmm. I was in, and I, but I met people like... Uh, M. Siyun, who had directed and produced Bruce Lee, The Man, The Legend, which was one of the... And I met the people at Golden Harvest who did Game of Death and the other quotation and stuff. My understanding is prior to Bruce Lee, um, there had been a, a general interest in the West for exploitative martial arts action films, just like maybe horror films or uh, spaghetti westerns, you know, like overseas produced films in a genre that would be appealing to primarily American theatrical audiences, mm -hmm. which was the main audience at that time. After Bruce Lee, people specifically came, buyers came with, you know, with, with checkbooks open, looking for Bruce Lee movies. Uh -huh. And of course, there were not going to be any more, sure. I mean, beyond Game of Death and Bruce Lee, the legend documentary, there were going to be no more Bruce Lee movies. So I think the locals, well, I know that they said, you know, they worked on the basis that for the, from the perception of most Westerners, all Chinese look alike, not for me or Alex, but the perception in the 70s was Western people think all Bruce, all Chinese people look alike, particularly if you put them in like bangs, ripped physique, nunchucks, like scars on their face going, ah, and then they look the same. Right. So it was purely for export. I do think there were instances where these films played theatrically in Hong Kong, but I almost feel that was an afterthought. I don't think anybody anticipated this. A couple of them actually, I think, in the immediate aftermath of Bruce's passing, a couple of them kind of did okay. And I think local audiences were not taken in. Sure. And I almost feel that they were not, not, not taken in by, um, by the fact that it wasn't the real Bruce Lee. They, they would know that. I think they were not taken in because the films were not that good. I think if somebody had made a film of quality within the context of which there is a Bruce Lee character, they would have liked it more. And I even think that people always talk about the fact that the guys who immediately followed Bruce Lee as action idols, or when they had George Lazenby in films, that the audiences didn't accept them. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think what happened is that the films were no good. And they actually, they didn't accept Jackie until the films got good. And I think that there's definitely, globally, but particularly in Hong Kong, a sense of like, I don't go and see a guy who looks like Bruce Lee or can do kicks and punches. I go and see a movie. And if the movie's entertaining, like Snake and the Eagle Shadow was, wow, I found myself a new hero. But if it's like perceived to be not like Killer Meteors or something, it doesn't matter it's the same actor. They're not going to uh, be interested. What is that? Fantasy Mission Force? Or <laughs> yeah. <that>? So <laughs> people are not going to <laughs> right. sit still for that. And people didn't sit still for the fake Bruce Lee movies because they were not good. Had they been entertaining? I mean, 
I mean, there was a, there, there were ways to do it. Like uh, Bru- J- Samo had a hit with Enter the Fat Dragon. Yes. But that works. I was just watching it the other day. It works on so many levels. It is a genuinely affectionate pastiche of Bruce Lee. And of course, he has that wonderful scene when he actually goes in and uh, fights a fake Bruce Lee. We're doing a bad which job. Is fantastic, yeah. <laughs> you know. But then he did the whole, the whole movie he does is this kind of fat Bruce Lee and yes. everybody. And the, but the film is well performed. It's funny. The action scenes are great. And so it works as a piece unto itself. He could actually have done the whole film playing it just as Sama without the Bruce, Bruce Lee mannerisms. And it would still have been successful. It didn't depend on, oh, look, there's a fake Bruce Lee. It didn't depend on people suspending their disbelief. But I remember going into early, uh, in the early parts of video, VHS videotape in England, it was a rental market. You went to rent the videos. So buying the films was prohibitively high. Right. And there was an area in London where they would sell the VHS tapes for like 60 pounds, which was a Quite That's a, a lot of money, significant yeah. amount at that time, uh, and it, not coincidentally, it was in the Arab neighborhood in London. So, I think a lot of Arab guys had video players, and they liked kung fu movies. And I remember being with a friend of mine who was, you know, not a Bruce Lee fan. He he said, oh, Bruce, I said, you know, same thing you experienced. You know, like he said, I thought Bruce only made five movies or whatever. And then he goes in the store, and there's a whole wall of Bruce Le Lee Le Dragon Lee movies. Well, what are all these? And I kind of had to explain. Well, they're guys that look like Bruce Lee. Right. It is. By the way, I want to say, in the context of trying to explain it, it is an extraordinary phenomenon. And I applaud Michael Worth and the other people who have kind of given it serious um, thought. Because it speaks to something that I don't know exists before, during, before or after, which is a, for whatever reason, because however much a film is created for exploitative reasons, the making of it is still a work of art. Mm-hmm. You can't get away from the fact that you have a script, you have a cameraman, you have mise-en-scene, you have choreography, you have performance. So you're making something creative, purely inspired by an absence, the absence of Bruce Lee. And it inspired this plethora of films. And that is a very interesting cultural phenomenon. I think the fact that they're examining it and there are people writing books about it is really worthy. For me, the, in, the fact that it's a fascinating subject of study doesn't mean that when you look at some of these things, you're not like, Jesus, you know, couldn't they have had a take two of that? You know, you, you see Bruce Lur and some girl says, you know, uh, like, you know, um, I remember there's one movie I saw the other day when she sits down with him and she says, well, Bruce, I'm sorry to tell you, but while you were away, your mother died. And Bruce Lur goes, <clears throat> and I'm like, wow. <laughs> no, it was it. He's sitting on a couch and he goes, <clears throat> and then they move on with the conversation. And I'm like, you know, no, what, what is this? He's not really a human being. He's, right. He literally is like a clone or a cyborg of Bruce Lee. Wow. Who, who do you think was the best out of all of those in terms of performance? Oh, Let's definitely. Say, okay. Acting, who is the best? And in terms of uh, imitating Bruce Lee's fighting shtick? Well, I think it was split. I think that uh, Bruce Lai or Bruce L.I., Ho Chung Do, was definitely an act, uh, was definitely the best actor mm-hmm. of them and, and, and gifted as a martial artist. Mm-hmm. I always felt that in terms of just the ripped physique and the, he had a good range. He could do the Bruce Lee stuff, but he could do traditional Kung Fu as well as Bruce Le L.E. But if you said name one, then it was Bruce Lai, mm-hmm. L.I., was the guy who had the best skill set. Do you think um, Kim Tai Chung was hampered by being Korean and not Chinese? I think he was hampered by the fact that he was such a ghastly actor, which you sort of talk uh-huh. about bad acting. You uh-huh. look at Tara Death. And it's, again, I'm surprised that a director with the experience of Mseon couldn't have somehow got a better performance out of him as an actor. Right. So that was number one. But number two, I think he... I he, never saw Tower of Death. I only saw the fight scene between him and Casanova Wong. That's I think, pretty good, isn't it? Which is an amazing no, fight no, scene. No, his action yeah. is fine. Yeah. And then he's doubled also by Yun Biu for yes. a lot of the... Also in Game of stuff. Death, too. And when he's fighting uh, Bob Wall. In, I don't mean... I mean in Game of Death also, not yeah. in Game of Death, too. Uh, when, uh, the, the aerial flip is right. Yun Biu. You can Yun see, Biu. here's Bruce Lee from Way of the Dragon. Here's Kim Tai Chong. Um, there's Yun Biu doing a flip. Well, all game, in the game same of death, scene. Game of Death is a whole other conversation isn't yeah. it because i mean it's it straddles that border where it's kind of it was conceived it goes a lot to what i'm saying about however exploitative a film is it becomes necessarily necessarily the making of it is a, is, a, is, a, is a work of art right and that's true of game of death though it was purely created to exploit the remaining footage of the bruce lee left behind from his game of right. death project 
So for me, I look at and even the, the the sequel, so to speak. You know, though it's not te- I don't think it's technically really a sequel, but the follow on film, Power of Death, Game of Death Two, and then you had uh, Kim Tai Jung, and they were different versions of the second film. Some of them it's the same as the first. They try to say, look, this is the real Bruce Lee, and use Bruce Lee, and then him as the fill in. And then there's other versions where it's just him start to finish uh-huh. as the brother of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee dies at the beginning, and the rest of the movie is him as the brother. <laughs> Excuse me. But I think uh, Kim Tai-chung just did those couple of films, so he couldn't really be held up to compare with the guys who made a living right. out of imitating. Uh, right. Of course, Kim Tai-chung was in the classic Bruce meets Jackie, where they have the Bruce Lee lookalike and the Jackie Chan lookalike. Uh-huh. Together. So that was, you know. And he's in No him. Retreat, No Surrender. Yes, where he's the ghost of Bruce Lee. Yes, I mean, yes. Again, I look at his performance there and I'm thinking, this was as good as you could do. This is where it comes down for me. It's like, whatever the motivation, the fact is you're on camera, you're meant to be giving a, a performance with integrity. And you can, I mean, I look at um, even, you know, oh, look at, look, even, I'm sorry, Jason Scott Lee in Dragon, which I think was <laughs> because it was a Bruce Lee movie, or perceived as a Bruce Lee biopic. People don't get the nuance of his performance. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I think he, one reason his career did not, span beyond that was because he was tied to okay this he's doing some kind of impersonation of bruce lee when you actually watch this see the film you see a lot more going on and i think if that had been brought into the exploitation films they would have been better uh, they would have been more interesting now because you'd have had more nuance to the character of bruce lee as opposed to yeah just a caricature which is what we saw you know and uh, but game of death was interesting and i mean when i discovered the I um, mean, back in the midst of time. I mean, yeah, the footage I has been seen by so bit. many people in so many formats now. I'm sure the fact that I discovered it initially is increasingly irrelevant. But I mean, I found the, the Game of Death dailies yes. uh, in 1997. And I dreamt about this footage. But watching it uh, was very interesting because I felt a lot of sympathy for when I tried to do something with it myself at Media Asia, the film company I worked for at the time. I had a lot of sympathy for the guys from 1978. It's like, what do you do with it? I mean, it's Bruce Lee in a yellow tracksuit fighting just the same guys that he fights in the 1978 version. Right. And it's one weird ass movie. Yes. I mean, he's killing people. A lot of people. expository, like weird dialogue in between the fight scenes. And he's stuff. killing people um, unnecessarily. You've got Jabbar with those pink ass eyes. <laughs> he doesn't really go up. He fights his way up to the top of the tower, but then he doesn't go up to the top of the tower. There's so much that we don't really know still right. about it. Um, I suspect in the wake of the massive success of Enter the Dragon and the, you know, the blank check you would be getting from Hong Kong and Hollywood, I have a sense that Bruce might have rethought it and said, do I want to release this as is or make it part of a documentary project? Would he go back and do it again? Um, Are you an instructor from the WT Wing Chun line and are confused about aspects of your Wing Chun training? Do you have questions about application, Guo Sao, Lat Sao, or how to train or teach Chi Sao? Do you need help with your curriculum or just guidance to push past your current skill level? Please consider coming to Florida and doing an immersion course with me. Immersion courses are 20 private lessons taught in five days in a very serious and intensive manner. These are done in my Florida home so you can stay there and focus on your training in the sunshine. Courses are individually crafted to your needs after we have a consultation. No politics, no nonsense, just serious training. Click the link in the description of this episode to find out more about immersion training with me in Florida. I'm currently filling up spots for March and April of 2023, so apply today to get one of those dates. Spots are limited because of my schedule, so book before the end of February 2023. Again, the link for immersion training in Florida is in the description below, and I'll see you in the sunshine. So for those, like... For yeah. anyone in our audience who doesn't know, so in, in 78, when they completed Game of Death, basically spinning a film around three fight scenes, yeah. it was very difficult to cut that into something and then reverse engineer a film from beginning to end. Um, I think many fans kind of felt, well, there may have been more footage. Obviously, there would have been outtakes. It would have been cut from something longer. And you're basically the guy who found that. Well, I mean, there was two um, productions. There was one was Game of Death and one was the documentary Bruce Lee, The Legend. And Game of Death was directed by Robert Klaus, who had done Enter the Dragon, which was the real global breakthrough Bruce Lee film. Mm -hmm. And he basically, I think, just came in and did it as a job of work. And I think the reason the film got made at all, a primary reason was that uh, Raymond Chow had already sold the Japanese rights for a a lot of money, I think even before Bruce Lee died, uh, for a Game of Death project. He didn't want to give the money back. 
I also think he maybe had spent money, that money on other productions that hadn't been successful. So on a business footing, it made a lot more sense to deliver some kind of game of death. Uh-huh. So they gave Robert Klaus free reign, and he looked at the existing footage, didn't much like it, used the minimum of it right. available, and cobbled this other, you know, kind of action picture that kind of the script is kind of, it, it draws on the mythology. Was Bruce Lee involved with the triad? Did he fake his own death? Did he do this? Did he and do they that? put actual funeral footage from Bruce Lee's funeral in there, which is an interesting choice. Well, I, I think, Raymond's no, but I think, well, I, I think that was part of a sense of like, this film is really about Bruce Lee. And that will include footage from the funeral, which shows you that it's about Bruce Lee faking his own death. And here he is at his funeral, but he's come back. So again, much like, the Bruce exploitation genre as a whole, it's kind of a wish fulfillment. I wish Bruce Lee wasn't dead. And if you watch Game of Death, he's not because he comes back from the fake funeral and he continues to fight all the bad guys mm-hmm. in the Red Pepper restaurant. Red Pepper restaurant. Right. I mean, it's a guilty pleasure for me. It was the first Bruce Lee film I saw on the big screen and I still to this day watch and enjoy it for all its hokiness. And even the, the cardboard head uh, with the moving neck on Fantastic. the mirror. <laughs> I mean, how anybody looked at that and went, that'll do. But it does show you the mindset. I mean, it was similar then and similar. That basically, this is not a discerning audience. And by the way, it was almost like, and I think, you know, it was like Power of Death, Game of Death 2 was like them saying, if, you know, we got away, if you, if you wonder how we got away with that, check this out, you know, because then they did that second film. But then also Bruce Lee, the legend was the one I remember had outtake footage and for the first time, you, but it was all out of sequence. Uh, and also there was a lot of stuff that, you know, had not, uh, you know, was, was a lot of stuff that was not in Bruce Lee, the legend. And then I was uh, fortunate to be at Gold, uh, Media Asia at the time of the transition from the Golden Harvest Library being given over to our company for distribution. Uh, literally, figuratively, everything um, taken out from, uh, you know, from, from the studios and brought to Media Asia. So, and I was a, 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 given the job of helping with the, supervise that transfer. Again, you know, I think if a fan had wandered in off the street, you know, if uh, there are a lot of other people out there who have done fine work restoring and representing it, the likes of John Little, Alan Canvan, um, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of them. Right. But at that time, had they gone into the studio and said, I'd like to see the Game of Death footage, nobody would have showed it to them. Uh, it took another 20, 30 years to find all of the Game of Death footage, even then. Right. But in this instance, I at least could say, do you have any Bruce Lee footage that you're not quite sure what it is? And they gave me these rolls of film for Game of Death. So that I had the authority, let's say, to do that, and then laced them up and looked at it and went, holy moly, this is the... You didn't find, did you find any other footage of Bruce Lee while working there? I, uh, the only thing that was interesting that remains a mystery to this day was there was another roll of film from Enter the Dragon the same source material that was then that had been used for the Bruce Lee footage, the unseen Bruce Lee footage in, in, in Power of Death, Game mm-hmm. of Death 2, all of that. And it was towards what evidently is a Chinese version of Enter the Dragon, which nobody, not even Fred Weintraub, when I asked him about it, could remember. Because Although they you, were going to do like a Cantonese version or they a would Mandarin version? They would, well, they began it. And I suspect it became too convoluted and they stopped. But there are this footage of Bruce and Betty Chung talking in the room in Cantonese and Bruce telling uh, Bob Wall to get out in Cantonese and then Set Keen giving his speeches in the tournament field in Cantonese. Wow. Uh, so that existed. And not surprised hard to they do. wouldn't just dub it. Huh? I'm surprised they wouldn't just dub it. Uh, well, this, is, I think, probably was a process. Right. But um, for whatever reason, I think maybe Raymond was like, well, we're shooting Sync Sound some degree and we'll 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 i mean i know they did a lot of looping later but they did shoot sound on the set i believe and so it was like well you know what we'll just do a um we'll do a chinese version and a, a english version and then we'll have you know both markets covered anyway that for whatever the rationale was and the thing is you know nobody a lot nobody i've met over the years and nobody alive now seems to be aware of this but the footage exists wow so there's another bit of a mystery. So that was the other big thing that I located that I found. But you, but you saw that. So these alternate scenes, like Bruce speaking, yep. can't, wow. I can send it to you and you can put it on your podcast. I think it's already on YouTube, though. Oh, interesting. But anyway, I, um, and then there was all the Game of Death stuff. I was whoa. And then I went back to Media Asia and I had a hell of a time convincing my Media Asia colleagues the value of this. Right. And then uh, the two things that made them realize 
uh, that there was value was firstly that um, a Japanese uh, producer flew to Hong Kong the next day and then wrote them a check for a huge amount of money. And they just couldn't believe it. They actually were criticizing me that I put the, the, the dot in the wrong place uh, on the check. And I said, no, this is what his offer is. And wow. then they came in and it was, the, I've never seen a deal done at mediation with that speed done handshake. And then they sat there going, holy moly, what is this? And that Japan deal was like a one-off. And then uh, John Little was desperate to get the footage. And, and again, I, sometimes, you know, you think you're doing, you're doing, um, you know, uh, Bruce Lee's art. So probably you should think about direct, right? A right. direct approach. Right. For several years, he was calling all of my Chinese colleagues and avoiding me. And all the Chinese colleagues, one after the other, put their head around them and said, there's this Wailo ringing us. Can you deal with it? Like in Chinese, why dog, why? Ghost fight, ghost. <laughs> but then at the time, for various reasons, I was not particularly, uh, John was not particularly in my good book, which is bad news for him because I had the game of death footage and he didn't. Right. But I'd figured out there was nothing I could do with it apart from squeeze some value, sell it globally, hope somebody used it well, because me, I couldn't really come up with a surefire way to exploit it. And Media Asia didn't at that time want to spend the money. And I think if I'd got the experience I have now as a producer, I would have thought differently. And um, so I was, you know, a mid-level executive at Media Asia. So I didn't have the ability to green light or to put significant funds towards making a, a wraparound movie again. And at the same time, I did feel that I wasn't going to be like, I believe that, by the way, there is some still, still some footage in, in Hong Kong that private collectors have. And it's like, God, look, they're precious. They're not going to share it. I wasn't like that. I was like, I found this stuff. I want everybody to see it. So we did the different deals that we did. And I did a deal with John. Uh, I've always, did, I've always, I hope, tried to separate doing business with people and doing and, and how, how you feel about them personally. Uh -huh. And John's actually not a bad guy. He made some, in, in my perception, some wrong decisions in the way that he was dealing with me. Uh -huh. But at the same time, he's not a bad, in any regard, a bad person. Yeah, I and love so John. We just, yeah, yeah. You know, he is a good guy. And we kind of just clashed. I don't know. It was like, I, I, for some reason, I don't know why. I, we talked about this the other day. And I take my, my side of responsibility. With all of these guys, he, it's funny. He's actually the most normal of all of those Bruce Lee aficionados. But they're a pretty strange bunch. and. To different degrees. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, th I think everyone who is into Bruce Lee has their own little thing, hang-ups or whatever. The, 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 I think the only thing I can say about in my own instance is that I, and this goes even to doing the, the History Channel Bruce Lee documentary when I was dealing with a mutual friend of ours to try to get Betty Ting Pei on camera. And I'm coming from the perspective as being a day-to-day, -day even back when I found the Game of Death footage, that mm -hmm. wasn't my job. John Little's job was finding the Game of Death footage. My job was being a film company, a filmmaker in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. or at that time, a guy working at a film company in Hong Kong. The only white guy mm -hmm. who was a Bruce Lee aficionado working at a film company and understanding the professional way in which the business should be operated. And I don't know that, or that the others did or should understand that, but I always came from a perspective of this is how, you know, we should do something. Mm -hmm. um, and the decision not to do my own movie was a professional one. I couldn't find the money. I felt, I feel the clock was ticking. Well, I knew the Japanese were going to put something out. So we had to do something else. So we did the Hong Kong Legends deal and they, they did a version of it. We did a deal with John for um, his journey. journey. Indeed. And, and I, I was, I, I talk about it in my book. I was, I was kind of, I sold him the material at a, he didn't think I was going to sell it to him at all. And I said, no, no, if you can come up with the money, of course I will. And I did. And then he was looking for like clips from the other movies for free. And I made him pay the market rate for those as well. And that was me. I was not happy with him at the time. If I had it to do over, I would have thrown that stuff in. But um, that, was, that was where things were at that time. Plus, you know, I was happy. And then he came to Hong Kong in the wake of filming in Korea. We had a, a great time at the Bruce Lee Cafe, which I used to run on Robinson Road, which to this day, I think is the only full-time, certainly the only time Bruce Lee Cafe, maybe the only full-time Bruce Lee Museum run by an actual actor from a Bruce Lee movie, John Ben. And I think um, Little was on a mission from the estate because he comes in, you know, he's you've been on your show. He's such a affable Canadian, very polite. And he comes in and we had dinner and he said, so, you guys are really missing out here. And I said, well, how do you feel? He goes, well, you're calling it the Bruce Lee Cafe. I said, what should we call it? Little Dragon Inn? What? And he goes, no, because John Ben here is a legend. You should call it the John Ben Cafe. Uh -huh. I said, we're losing money hand over fist with the name of the greatest icon, popular icon in the 21st century. And you're telling me we'll make more money 
with a restaurant named after him. <laughs> and, and John said, well, at least think about it. I said, yeah, I'm think about it. And I've been laughing about it ever since uh -huh. because obviously the Bruce Lee estate had researched the law at that time in Hong Kong. And my recollection of British copyright law uh, at that time, at least, um, uh, individuals do not have any rights after their passing. Right, there's no descendant rate of publicity. No, yeah. not no, at that time. In, yeah. in, in, I've looked into that, too, because I've I'm not, some of my own projects. Yeah. Right. Well, Hong Kong was under British law yeah. at the time. Uh, and it was just on the cusp of 1997. To this day, still, British law pretty much applies. So they couldn't do anything about us having a cafe. I never quite understood. I mean... Why would you want to? Because it's like, this is your brand. And if mm -hmm. somebody is sincerely, you know, promoting your one brand, you know, um, why would you want to stop them? I didn't, I didn't understand the rationale behind it. But that their main, the only effort they made was that John Little was sent as an emissary. And I think John Ben actually might have thought about it. And I was like. <laughs> well, yeah, he'd probably be happy if it was yeah, named after him. bless him. He was a great character. Yeah. Certainly was. But no, I mean, and I, I've talked about the instance of finding the Bruce Lee footage, that Game of Death footage. And I'm not a great, um, you know, I'm not big into like, you know, the spirit of Bruce moves through me or whatever. Um, I, had a, I remember one time being on the back lot at Golden Harvest and walking around and just trying to imagine, you know, there's a line from a Bruce Springsteen song, Waiting on the Ghost of Tom Joe. And I, I was like, maybe I'm wait, waiting on the ghost of Bruce Lee. But not like a, not like in narrative no surrender but i mean just the spirit of something uh and if you're a spiritual person then you may think maybe i can experience something by being there so that was one occasion but the other occasion was in this in the viewing room a very spartan viewing room and looking at this footage for the first time and i mean i don't mind admitting you know i dissected and viewed and analyzed all of the existing game of death footage and dreamt about literally what was what else was there and uh, there's one shot just before Bruce fights uh, Chi Hon Tsui, and he just walks up to camera. He does this thing. He's actually his hand is below the, the length of, below the frame of the camera, and he just brings it up and does this gesture like this. And I felt my chair go back on its wheels. It was just this energy came off the screen. So you make of that what you will. But I do remember that, and I'm I'm fairly level headed about that. I'm not big into you know the ghost of Bruce Lee to sure. this or that. But there's definitely, there was this charisma, if nothing else. What about the ghost of Lee Daga? Oh, oh in, it's in this. <laughs> Again, well, you, know, but you know what's interesting is that that movie, uh, actually, like the other, the early um, uh, seasonal films, yes. it had heart to it. Yes. And the later films moved away from that. Um, and Keith Strandberg, who wrote the script for that, who worked on the later films, who's a dear, sweet guy, um, I always felt he, and I could really empathize as usually I would be in his position. I would be the white guy mm -hmm. on a production in Hong Kong or in China, um, trying to make my, fight my case and my position. I think, I think Keith, he spoke really good Chinese, but he kind of leaned much more towards going with the flow. Mm -hmm. But I think he really needed to kind of like, the reason the later films didn't do so well is they moved away from that. But the first No Retreat, No Surrender actually is, works as yes. a piece yes because it follows the kung fu comedy formula in a way it's like you know the father is crippled the son goes to take revenge is humiliated goes to find a master in this case it's not the drunken master it's bruce lee yes trains with bruce lee comes back and fights and defeats and the villain is like a wong jan lee character but it's john claude van damme yes. and it works then you look at the later movies and they kind of for some reason moved away from that right. and i'm I wasn't involved with the films, but I'm surprised that they didn't analyze it and realize, you know what? And some of them had their moments, the later, because there's a whole run of them. And much to Keith's chagrin, Keith Strandberg's chagrin, they were shot under other titles, and they'd always be released as No Retreat, No Surrender 4, uh -huh. you know, King of the Kickbox. There's No Retreat, No Surrender 5, you know. But they, um, they kept cranking them out. I think the last one was American Shaolin, and uh, then that was it, which is, again, has its merits. But I think, you know, you get away, if you have, if you, we were talking the other day about The Last Dragon, you know, again, the reason that film has stayed the test of time is it has heart to it. Yes. If you have a movie that has heart and the audience are engaged, I had it the other day, I was watching just randomly while I was on my stationary bike, like the one that Kung Fu Genius has in the corner at my place in Lantau, and I just, a movie to watch, I put on Yip Man 2, 
which I hadn't seen in a while, and going, wow, this film really still works. It, the performances are great. The action's great. The filmmaking is great. Everybody did a good job. My youngest son, who's 13, who's normally on his computer looking at, you know, kind of gaming stuff, just turned around. He had to watch the whole thing because he needed to know what would the consequence be of Darren killing Sam Hung in the ring. Like, how was that going to be avenged? What was going to happen? He was totally engaged by it. He couldn't look back at his video screen. Had to see what happened. Now, there's any number of other martial art pictures of the last 20, 10, 20 years where they haven't delivered that kind of heart that you, you go, you're meant to appreciate, oh, this guy's good looking, this guy's this, this guy's that. And, you know, uh, I, I was talking about like, the old school. I've had the experience of working with the old school actors of Hong Kong cinema and the modern era of these pretty boys and girls that come in. And they are massively catered to on the set. You know, you have everybody kind of pampering them. But then when you see the finished film coming back, you don't have any great feeling of engagement with them. Maybe the films as a whole are not structured in a way that you would feel, oh, I, I'm really emotionally engaged by that. I mean, there was a Wong Fei Hong from Rise of the Legend, which definitely the fight scenes are brutal and really well executed. But I, I didn't feel emotionally engaged by right. it at all. I saw I that on, the, on some plane ride over. Didn't I feel, felt the same you know, way. Any, and it didn't have heart to it that I really cared about the characters. Right. Even though the action was amazing and it had Sam Hung fighting, what else do you want from a Kung Fu movie? Sure. Just did not work. Um, and I looked again just recently at True Legend, So Hat Yi, with a Jim Man joke. And that actually still holds up because, again, they actually, it's about a family. It's about an, an, the, a gay, one of the great action heroes, Monke, Andy On, on, on she Git, plays the villain. And he should have been, you know, a bigger star. He's so good in that film. Uh, but again, if you looked at the production value and you look at the action choreography, you look at the casting, these are kind of comparable films. But one of them, to me anyway, you look at it, you go, oh, I'm so engaged by this. I want to see what happens next. I care about these characters. Sure. And some of them, it's just an exercise in productivity and filmmaking right. without that heart to it. Yeah. Thing. Uh, because we have a couple, um, I suppose, uh, format geeks who watch my uh, podcast. Yeah. When you said you sold, uh, or Media Asia sold the rights to the Japanese yes. for that game of death footage. So uh, just like, like a very practical question. You have the film on, a, on the film reel. Yeah, and when you sell it to them, what format do the Japanese receive that film in? They get it on some kind of disc, but, uh, they get it, or, or is it printed? Like I, I want, like I want to know. It was a theatrical release in uh, Japan, so for the God, yeah, I think it would have been different. I think John, uh, John's probably going to pop up and you know kind of contradict me. I think he would have got it. What then was Betacam video cassette, which is a very thick um, tape in big gray plastic boxes. He would have been delivered something in that got it, form got because it, got I don't it. think there was ever any thought that uh, Warrior's Journey was going to be a major theatrical release. Uh, G.O.D. For, for Japan, they anticipated it being theatrical. So they would have had like a, I think a, they would have had a, uh, a dupe of the, uh, of the footage on, uh, I guess, you know, whatever the 35 mil dupe okay. of that footage to work from to get that, um, clarity of to get the clarity of image that they would need. I don't mm -hmm. think it would have been sufficient for them to get a beta cam tape and then work from that towards a theatrical print. Understood. They would have needed to access the theater. It was a long time ago, but my understanding is we had uh, in Kowloon Bay SFC, which was the I don't remember the name of it, what SFC stood for, but it was this. It wasn't underground, but it felt like it was. It was like a bunker with everything in it. Well, they had all the posters there that I now have. That's that 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 they were all kept there. Temporarily, right. after they came from Golden Harvest, they went there. And then they came to me. Did you do the Bruce Lee voice for one of those releases? I, it, when they did God, they came back to Hong Kong and reached out to me and said, "Would I come in and do the voice of Bruce Lee?" How did they know you could do it? Because you have an uncanny Bruce Lee. There was impression. an annual, uh, yeah, which has become increasingly politically incorrect over the years. But yes. at the time, none of us thought much about it. But anyway, so apologies to the Chinese race. I mean, <laughs> not. Well, the last time I'm going to have to make apologies to offending the Chinese people. But um, at the time, uh, we had an annual um, kind of gathering of Japanese Bruce Lee fans. And um, they would all gather at the Jordan Hotel in Chim Sa Choi. And we would then... The BP Hotel, right? Or, the BP or, Hotel. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry. The BP Hotel, right. sorry. On Jordan Road, I think, in, in, in Chim Sa Choi. And then I would get on the stage and 
uh, uh, introduced Austin to everything. Road, Austin Road. I think Austin Road, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. You know, there's a jet lag does for you folks. I forgot my old hometown. <laughs> Austin Road, the BP Hotel. You guys, didn't that, that's, yeah. that's where that's you guys were. That's a common place I stay when yes. I'm in Hong Kong. Yeah. So, and Donnie Yen and I used to train in the gym at right. Tom Turk's on the top floor. But we used to have these, and a couple of interesting things happened, if you don't, if you don't mind me telling you about those yeah, shows. You could tell the Japanese story. Yeah, well, there was, uh, one was um, that uh, Donnie Yen was working on uh, his TV Fist of Fury, in which I played, you know, uh, the Russian boxer Petrov. And uh, he wanted to premiere his trailer and rushed over from ATV to show it to a room full, exclusively Japanese people. And the first shot is Donnie, stripped to the waist, all muscular like Bruce Lee, tearing the Japanese flag in two. While he says, Chung am my dumb ma bing fu, you know. And and I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna get lynched. And he goes, Yeah, I'd forgotten that was on there. <laughs> but then, you know, it actually the Japanese were like, after I said to them, I said, sorry about the whole tearing of the flag thing. And they said, No, this was the bad Japanese. We are the good Japanese. Wow. So we got away with it. But wow. that was one moment. Another one was when I was working on your Sifu's um uh one of your uh, Lung Ting Sifu's movie, it's a mad, 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 mad kung fu world. And it's kind of this weird pastiche documentary. I don't know really what it was. I don't know how you can describe it. I was a newsreader in one of my scenes. And um, the, the payoff gag is that I announced that Godzilla is marching through Hong Kong. And then a giant papier-mâché green Godzilla foot crushes the desk that I'm sitting at. And I have to, in, with some agility, roll out the way. And um, the way it was constructed is that it was a papier-mâché foot on a wooden board. So I wasn't worried about the papier-mâché foot, but if the board hit me, it would have been lights out. So, you know, all across the land, some people watching this going, <laughs> but no, so I'm sitting there and I did like a shot of me rolling away from a distance, one of me diving away. And then there's the, the, the money shot, which they did last, is me underneath looking up, seeing this board descend and rolling out of the way in time that the board would destroy the desk and not destroy me in the process. And all I could think of the next day was the Bruce Lee presentation to the Japanese. And I could imagine my son Ryan coming out and saying with a translator, you're so sorry, and Mr. Logan San cannot be here today. Yesterday, he was crushed by Godzilla. <laughs> and all the Japanese people going like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> if ever there was an audience who would accept as a reason of non-appearance death by Godzilla, it was this Japanese crowd. <laughs> so that was, then there was an occasion when I think the projector broke. And it was just one of those spontaneous things when I did the whole scene from, uh, you know, the beginning of Enter the Dragon, you know, right. don't think fear, right. like a finger pointing away to the moon. Right. Which at the time, I don't think that many people were doing it. And then um, it was purely like, I almost feel like um, it, the reason I did it for, um, well, John Little did it for the, for the restoration of um, Enter the Dragon by Warner Brothers which I couldn't quite understand because there was actually existing audio footage of Bruce Lee that could have been sweetened and used. Uh -huh. But for whatever reason, he did it. He chose to do it. In Game of Death, there was no audio. We didn't find any audio anyway. So I would just have to lip read and figure out the lines and then say them in a Bruce Lee kind of voice. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I said yes to it and the reason it never occurred to me any political incorrectness was if there had been somebody... Chinese, Chinese American around who we knew who was available, affordable, could do it, would come in, or then yeah, but there just wasn't. So it was just like, can you do it? We know we need it done by this. So I just stepped in and did it. Right. And I think a lot of the times um, when you see, I mean, I think there's two kinds of um, inappropriateness. There is when somebody with options and with all these other choices <laughs> decides to be culturally insensitive. Because they don't care. Right. And then I think there's also, and I don't know if I'm, you know, in some way just, in some way kind of like justifying it unduly, but a sense of like people just going problem solving without a thought of, oh, there's maybe somebody who's going to be one, at some future time people might be offended by that, or even today they would be. But it, it, there's no sense of like, I'm doing it to piss people off or I'm doing it because I don't care. It just hasn't been a consideration. Mm -hmm. It's just been, we need to do this so we, so we do that. And um, that was definitely the case in Hong Kong at that time. And um, I, to me, I look at somebody in, for example, one of the Bond movies, like Man with the Golden Gun. They have the, the two nieces fighting on behalf of James Bond. And they're talking to each other in the back of a car, and one speaking Mandarin and the other speaking Thai. I'm thinking you know, that you kind of probably could 
yes. deal with, right? right? But then things like, oh, we need a guy to do a Bruce Lee voice. Or Bay does it. We'll have him do it. It was more, more of a pragmatic solution, you know. Uh, there was no other option at that time. But, you know, with the Bond movie, I almost feel like they probably could have done because sure. of the way, the way that was set up. Um, it's always tricky when you get into these things. And it's always difficult when you judge the past by the present in all kinds of ways. Uh, and, and so I, I've read, you know, certain pundits or people, and I believe even when um, Alan Canvan did his remix of uh, Game of Death, which, I, I, you know, did a good job with it to his de today. I think it's the only thing he's done. So, right. I mean, he's focused on it. Like I say, that's become his profession, right. which is never was mine. Right. But he did it. But I think even he brought the Chris Kent voice back to do the war cries. So, yeah. And yeah. I'm not sure what they did for the voice. Maybe he right. found a Chinese guy. But they had Chris Kent again doing the war cries. And there were comments about that. So I'm not sure where we landed on that overall of people doing an impersonation of Bruce Lee. But I certainly did the best I could at the time with good intention to whatever I could do towards getting this finished and out to the public from finding the footage, to doing the voice of Bruce Lee. I, I did it. Um, and then later this came up as a concern, or oh, you should have found the Chinese guy. And I was like, yeah, maybe. You know who would have been the best, though I don't know that he would have been open to it, is Ted Wong. Yeah. Ted sounded just like Bruce. But I don't think I knew Ted yet at that time. But, you know, I talked with him. It was uncanny. He had a very similar Chris Cantonese background, but raised in the States. So similar voice. Why be? This hey. was amazing. I had Fantastic. such a good time. Uh, I'm not sure anything, else, I'm not sure anything else I wanted to talk about. I think we kind of covered the ground, so yeah, that's fine. Yeah, if people are interested in uh, the uh, all the awesome merchandise you have for all these cool Yeah, cool I mean, it's really, it's really one-stop shop. If you go to www.realeast.com, -E that's www.realeast.com, have my books. We have uh, the videos and instructional videos by my Sifu and many others. We have, including him and Kung Fu Genius together, and we have all this memorabilia, which including Bruce Lee memorabilia, but it's more of the Golden Harvest, Golden Princess films, which we sell that uh, online. And um, I'm trying to think what else. And of course, my main gig. I mean, I'm focusing in now. My main gig is, I think, you know, as a filmmaker, doing trying to do a movie a year, a documentary a year, and then getting more involved with book publishing and, and, and documentary filmmaking in this era. I used to have this kind of fixation, like I had to do a movie within 12 months. Uh -huh. uh, otherwise I was not relevant anymore. Uh -huh. And now I realized that, you know, I kind of maintained more than any other foreigner in Hong Kong, a kind of pretty consistent production schedule up until Furies. And I thought, I, I so loved Furies, thought it did well, thought it was well received. I thought it was an extraordinary film by my producing partner, Veronica Ngo, who directed it that rather than just do a film or a documentary to keep that going, work on something of quality. The last year I was writing, got my new place, uh, you know, your second home right. in Lantau. So I was writing and then hopefully in this next year, uh, looking towards doing a third Fury film um, and other productions, um, which will be revealed exclusively on the Kung Fu Genius podcast. <laughs> awesome. So stay tuned. <laughs> awesome, babe. Thank you so much. I know. I'm sorry I wasn't as funny as Richard Norton, but uh, <laughs> try my best. <laughs> awesome. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. Support us on Patreon. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chun is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor You know, it's funny because I'm sitting here now On this kind of backless chair I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger on another interview He kind of traded out the chairs Because he says if you put him like an arm tray, he falls asleep during the interview and so he's kind of like he wants the wooden chair and i've got yeah. no back to this so i'm going to be like you know <laughs> holding my stance hi girls give i was a, a give, give it give it about five seconds this will make the outtakes anything oh that's adorable oh, i okay. you cut down some of that herbal burble at the end about political correctness i don't know if it's gonna uh, well, you have a look and see. I don't know. Yeah, I we'll take a look. Read. Well, I'll take a look. You have a look. Uh, if, you, if you find it interesting and helpful, is, go ahead. Our editor is Asian. Oh, there you go. If you did, Andrew, if you don't like it, just cut it out.